Our sermon message for this morning is love each other as I have loved you. This comes to us from John 15, verses 12 to 13. And I'm going to go ahead and open by reading that key scripture. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Famous and important words to follow. And so we're going to discuss this morning how we can be a true friend to people. And in so doing, I'm going to frame our conversation by talking about God's love. And so we'll tackle that uh, important topic kind of right off the bat. What is love really? Where does it come from? Is it just a human invention? Is it a collection of emotions that we feel like butterflies in the stomach? Or is it something more or vastly more important? Different people have different definitions of love, for sure. Actually, if you put a room full of 100 people and ask them, everyone, tell us what your definition of love is, you get some great answers, I think, and some odd answers, and everything in between, right? But I think if we dwell upon this subject for any length of time, we must come to the conclusion that it's more than just a feeling. It's feeling, but with something else. Our emotions are important, but they come and go sometimes, right? But there's something else going on behind the scenes which captivates mankind and causes us to chase after the strange and wonderful and mysterious thing called love throughout our entire lives. Now, going on a first date, for example, can provide us with that nervous stomach feeling and these romantic fireworks, right? But we know that this doesn't always often last forever. It's just kind of like infatuation, right? And statistically, this honeymoon period uh, think about how long it might last in your own mind. Take a minute, what you think it uh, statistically, how long it would last. One to three years, okay? Three years is the tops. And then we start to get to know the real person, right? So in the beginning, uh, for example, when I was dating my wife, I couldn't eat and I couldn't sleep and I had all these butterflies in my stomach and maybe she did too, I don't know. But then after, uh, I don't know, one to three years, she got to know the real me, right? Um, and, and warts and all. So what comes after this honeymoon period is more interesting, I think. And I think uh, we can agree that what comes after is more like an act of the will or a decision to keep loving, as opposed to maybe an emotional high that our culture is so fascinated with and excited by, right? Romance is king when it comes to movies and books. And everyone enjoys watching a good romantic comedy or reading an enthralling love story. It's very, very popular. Most action movies have at least one side plot where there's a heroine that falls in love with the leading man or vice versa. But let's dig a little bit deeper. What lies beneath the honeymoon stage? What is all the fuss about when it comes to true love? How do we equate it with Jesus's discussion of love? And by the way, not everybody understands this. Uh, so what happens is they leave their partner and they get remarried whenever that honeymoon feeling wears off. Uh, and the cycle goes kind of on and on and over and over again. Hook up, shack up, break up when the butterflies go away and then they keep doing it, right? Um, talk to somebody in their 20s right now that's in the dating pool, okay? They'll have a lot to tell you. Uh, but now that we are beginning to understand what God might say love really is, Let's dissect it, because the Bible lists numeral, numerous examples, both uh, love given and received, and usually it involves an act of the intellect and the will, not just the heart. So, for example, deciding to make sacrifices for your kids, even though it may be detrimental to yourself. Deciding to stay with your spouse through difficult times when it might seem easier to get a divorce. Doing something hard when you'd rather wouldn't, staying when you'd rather leave, choosing to care when it would seem easier to ignore and wash your hands of the situation, right? And this type of agape or altruistic love or sacrificial love isn't common. It's not common. It's rare. And when it does show up, the world takes notice. Now, remember the Israelites in the desert who complained for a number of years. Right? When they were wandering around as God led them out of slavery. How often did God probably throw up his hands at humanity? But still, he remains faithful to us. God never really left them in the desert, by the way. Uh, we'll put a scripture up here. This is from Exodus. 
By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Was God always there? Did he always show them the path? Did he always guide them? Yes. And I don't want you to assume that this, this, by the spiritual definition of love that we're talking about, which is an act of the will or the intellect, that the emotional experience is less important, because it isn't. Um, and the two go hand in hand, I think. But the main idea is this, that God loved us enough as an act of the will and his intellect to sacrifice the, his one and only son on the cross, right? So it's the one thing to imagine that uh, this sacrifice might have been just mythical or metaphorical or symbolic, and some people do think that. It's, it's odd. But it's another thing entirely to realize that it actually happened at a place and a time in history. And, and some of you um, have traveled to uh, the Promised Land and the Holy City, and you've walked the Via Della Rosa, and you've seen the Stations of the Cross and, and looked at Calvary, and you know where it took place. What a blessing that would be. And once we understand that Jesus was actually flogged by Roman soldiers, and that nails were actually used in the crucifixion, and they were real, then you know that you and I must have been worth dying for because God chose to do this for us freely. This was agape love in action. And it's this type of love that God has for us if you and I are willing to accept it. And this is what all the fuss is about, I think. This is what laying down his life for his friends actually means. So some of you might remember this. Uh, a number of years ago, my uncle died unexpectedly from heart disease. He went to bed feeling uh, a little sniffly and not well. Um, and he never did wake up, right? And so when I got the, the phone call a few days afterward, the sheriff told me that I was his only remaining kin, okay? So it was, it was on us to, to help out and take charge. Um, and so what followed was an intense few months of following up with lawyers and funeral home and the post office. And so we had to begin cleaning up my uncle's house in order to sell it and get it ready for the estate. Uh, and, and it fell into disrepair, okay? That's kind of a nice way of saying it. Um, and so it was, it was almost like something off the TV show Hoarders, right? Where you'd walk into a, a new room and there'd be boxes and phone books and newspapers piled high, and he would just collect things, um, no matter what condition they were in, right? And I think his television set was from 1970, seriously. Um, and his tool shed, he had this great big tool shed, and it was uh, floor to ceiling, practically, with tools and power tools. Um, and it was really quite something to see. Um, and, and I don't use power tools, that would not be a good situation for me, but it was impressive to know that other people know how to use all those tools. Today, there are some tools, I have no idea what they were, okay? No idea what they were used for, but I'm sure he did. In other words, we needed help to start sorting and cleaning everything because we were overwhelmed, I was grieving, and didn't really know what to do, one foot in front of the other, right? And so many people would say to me, man, that, what a mess. Uh, I'd like to help you, but I can't because I'm busy, right? Or I'd like to help you, but I can't because I won't. Um, or good luck, right? So at this point, my wife and I had reconnected with an old friend that she had gone to school with, and I remember thinking, you know, this lady was really neat, but I didn't understand at the time how much she would come to help us. And she volunteered to help us sort through and clean up my uncle's belongings. Some of my family helped also, but my wife's friend was instrumental. And she accepted no form of payment. I tried to write her a check one day, and she wouldn't have it. She walked out, and she would sacrifice her entire Saturday, some weekends. And I remember she had to have emergency surgery one day, um, and she was back the next weekend. I tried to tell her, you can stay home, but she wouldn't do it. And she hauled an old, empty water heater uh, up the steps and, and out the door by herself. How do you say thank you for that, right? Agape love. How do you say thank you for that? Where does this type of generosity come from. She never complained. She never gave excuses. She was simply there when we needed her. And that is what's God, that's what God's love is like, I think. It is there for us whenever we need it, even if we don't think we do, or that we can do it on our own. It shows up right when we need it, if we know how to recognize it. And so I want to share another piece of scripture here. It should be familiar. Matthew 10, 29, 31, are not two sparrows sold for a penny? 
yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your Father. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. God's love is long-suffering. Long-suffering. I had to kind of learn the meaning of that phrase when I first started out in ministry. That means he's patient. Okay? He will suffer through all of our silliness, all of our grudges, all of our unforgiveness, and he will wait on us to come to him. That's what agape love does. This is who he is. So I'm going to read off some scriptures now. They're not on the screen, uh, but the first one is 1 John 4, 16 to 18. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love. John 15, 9 to 10, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I want to talk about one more thing this morning as well, and that is that love isn't the same thing as kindness. What do you mean, Pastor John? That sounds weird. It can include being kind, but it's not the same idea. They are equal concepts. For example, I love my three kids immensely, but that doesn't mean I let them do whatever they want as long as they're happy, right? How far would that get me? <laughs> oh, and saying, I wish you would do that. <laughs> And I'm kind of a sappy dad. Sometimes I, I compromise too much there anyway. But I care too much about them to do that. My wife and I can't allow that. And now this is controversial nowadays, actually, uh, because many people think that as long as you aren't hurting me and I'm not hurting you, it's okay to do whatever you want, right? And we hear phrases like, do whatever feels right to you or follow your heart. And I think that because of this belief, there are sins that have been allowed to flourish and take hold today because sometimes when we follow our heart, we're not following what God wants for us, right? We're following what we want for us or what sounds best to us. And so the idea comes into play that if God were really all loving, that he would accept us no matter what we do and allow us to do whatever we want for as long as we want. But I don't think it works this way. And it is true that God is all loving and all forgiving, but we mustn't maintain a status quo of sin in our lives. He wants people to repent and put a trust in him. And so the love of Jesus makes these weird demands on us, right? And it makes demands on how we go through our life. And it's so much more than simply kindness or, or doing whatever might make us happy in the moment. And so real godly love is more like an act of the will or a decision of the intellect than it is a feeling or an emotion. And it says, I'm going to follow God even when I don't want to, even when I don't think it's a good idea, but I'll follow him anyway. And so one example of, of biblical sin I see a lot of today is something called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does this mean? And I think simply put, it means that mankind likes to rebel against God and against the Holy Spirit sometimes. And we blaspheme the Spirit. For example, Jesus, you stay on your side of the fence and I'll stay on mine. Or don't tell me I need to be saved, you need to be saved, right? Now listen, if you deny the landlord's existence, don't expect to live rent-free in his apartment for very long. No one sneaks into heaven on a loophole. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. So God makes demands on us, on our time, on our heart, on our faith. He loves us far too much to wander into trouble without guidelines and commandments. Jesus is our guideline. He is our plumb line. So love him back. Accept and put your trust in Jesus now. Direct your will and your intellect in his direction, not just what your own heart wants. And if you know agape love like this in your, in your human life, in your day-to-day -day life right now, you are lucky. But even so, I think it's just a shadow of what love the God, the Father has for us in the eternal realm. And so I'll read uh, something from 1 Corinthians here. 
1 Corinthians, Corinthians 2 9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has in store for those who love Him. I want us to focus on that for a moment uh, because we see what we consider to be examples of love every day, but just wait. No eye has seen. We hear things that we consider to be love and, and altruism and sacrifice, and surely they are, but just wait because no ear is heard. We can't get our mind around what God has in store if we love it. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's pray on it. Gracious Lord, may you continue to love us as your children. Even if we rebel, even sometimes we might anger you, help us to love you back anyway. Help us to love others even if we don't feel like it. And we pray this in Jesus' awesome name. Amen.